Hey econ students, this is Jacob Clifford. Welcome to the Microeconomics Unit 2 Summary Video. I've made a bunch of individual topic videos to help with all the concepts in this unit. But this summary video is designed to get all the concepts back in your brain and get you ready for your unit test or your final or the AP exam. So by the end of this video, you're gonna have all the concepts back in your head and the way we're gonna do that is with the study guide from the Ultimate Review Packet. You're gonna fill this out along the way. So make sure to go get this, download it, and print it out because you're gonna be using that in this video. Remember, I'm using the AP Economics curriculum but if you're in a college class or trying to pass the CLEP, it's all the same stuff. This is all introductory microeconomics. I'm gonna start it off with demand and then supply and then elasticity with elasticity to demand, elasticity to supply, and the two type of other elasticities, cross price and income. Then I'm gonna talk about equilibrium in consumer and producer surplus, then how these curves shift and changes in the market. Then we'll talk about price ceilings, floors, taxes, subsidies, government intervention, and finish it off with international trade. Okay, that's what we're doing, so let's do it. By this point, you feel extremely comfortable with the idea of demand, downward sloping, showing an inverse relationship between price and quantity. And remember that happens for three reasons, the substitution effect, the income effect, and the law of diminishing margin utility. If the price falls, then people are gonna buy more because they're gonna move away from substitutes. Substitution effect. If the price goes down, people are gonna buy more because they can buy more, that's the income effect. And to get people to buy more, you've gotta lower the price because they get less additional satisfaction from each additional unit, law diminishing margin utility. This is worth at least 50 noodles. And that's completely different than the five shifters of demand. These are things other than price that cause the demand curve to increase or decrease. These are all things that affect buyers and consumers. There's nothing that affects production here because that's supply. And inside here, there's only two things you gotta keep track of. Remember, inside the price of related goods, there's substitutes and complements. And inside income, there's normal and inferior goods. You probably feel really comfortable with that. So right now, take out the study guide and fill out topic two point one demand verify you know those shifters and make sure you can practice what happens when there's a change in the price of a substitute how does it affect the other good topic 2.2 is supply and again we're talking about production and producers it's got an upward sloping supply curve showing a direct relationship between price and the quantity supply the reason why it's upward sloping is because an increase in price gives producers an incentive to produce more because they can make more profit and here are the shifters notice that the price of the product does not actually shift the supply curve but the price of resources the inputs to produce the product does shift the supply curve. And the thing you gotta watch out for here is an increase in supply is always a shift to the right. It never goes up. Don't think of that. That's a decrease in supply. For example, when the government gives a subsidy, which is money to producers to produce more, that causes supply to shift to the right. That's an increase in supply. Now, a tax on producers that would decrease supply, shifting supply to the left. I'm sure you got it. Take out the study guide and fill out topic 2.2 for supply. Make sure you know those shifters. A lot of the time, your teacher is gonna move to putting supply in and demand together, but before we do that, let's jump into elasticity. And remember, there's four types of elasticity and four different equations you gotta know. Elasticity of demand, elasticity of supply, cross price elasticity, and income elasticity. But they all show the same idea. They show how sensitive quantity is to a change in price and show you the shape of a demand or a supply curve. If the demand is really steep, then that shows that quantity is insensitive to a change in price. So a big change in price leads to a small change in quantity. If a demand or supply curve is real flat, then quantity is very sensitive to a change in price. A big change in quantity from a small change in price. And if the quantity changes by the exact same amount as the price, then that's called unit elastic. Now that's a gross oversimplification because really it's not about the slope of the demand curve. You actually have to do the calculations because on the same demand curve, you might have down here that is more inelastic and up here that's more elastic. It all depends on the numbers. So just remember, elasticity is not the same as slope. And remember these numbers mean something. So if the number is zero, that means the demand is perfectly inelastic. People are gonna buy this no matter what when the price goes up they're gonna buy the same amount if it's less than one it's relatively inelastic if it's one unilastic greater than one it's relatively elastic and the last one perfectly elastic and you need to understand that there's reasons for this if the demand is more inelastic that's because it has few substitutes and it's a necessity if it's elastic it has a lot of substitutes and it doesn't really matter if you get it now or get it later when you're looking at the elasticity of demand you can also use something called the total revenue test it only works for demand it doesn't work for supply if the price goes up and the total revenue goes up or if the price goes down total revenue goes down the demand is inelastic if price goes up and total revenue goes down or if price goes down total revenue goes up 
up, then the demand is elastic. So on a test, your teacher's probably gonna say, okay, here's the price, it was $10, it fell to $8, and the quantity increased from 10 to 15. What's that demand curve, elastic or inelastic? So there's two ways to get the right answer. One is looking at the elasticity coefficient. That shows you a 50% change in quantity from a 20% change in price. That means the demand is elastic. Because the elasticity coefficient is greater than one. Or you can use the total revenue test. The total revenue before was $100, the total revenue after is $120. Price went down, total revenue went up, elastic demand. The point here is make sure you can do the calculations for the elasticity coefficients, make sure you understand the total revenue test, and make sure you know what those numbers mean. Topic 2.4 is elasticity of supply, but it's a lot of the same stuff you saw in topic 2.3, elasticity of demand. But instead of looking how sensitive quantity demand it is to a change in price, we're looking how sensitive quantity supplied is to a change in price. And again, that's giving you the shape of the curve, so vertical is perfectly inelastic supply, and then relatively inelastic supply, unilastic, relatively elastic, and perfectly perfectly elastic supply. But unlike demand, the cause has nothing to do with substitutes and how much people actually want this. It has to do with production. If a product is relatively easy to produce and resources are available, then the price goes up, the quantity supplied increases a whole lot, elastic supply. But if a product is hard to produce, takes a lot of time to produce it, and the price goes up, you can't produce that much more, and so quantity supplied increases only a little, that's relatively inelastic supply. And of course, a vertical supply curve means it doesn't matter if the price goes up, we're still only ending up with a certain amount we can't produce anymore. In topic 2.5, we have cross price elasticity and income elasticity, and the equations are pretty much the same as you've seen before. For cross price, it's the change in the quantity of one product relative to a price change in a different product. Remember, it tells you if two products are substitutes or complements. And for income elasticity, it shows you the change in quantity from a percent change in income. And this shows you if the good is a normal good or an inferior good. The one thing to watch out for is notice this is the percent change in quantity and the percent change in the price or the income. We're not talking about the raw change. So be careful when they give you the numbers, it makes you have to calculate percent first. I know I'm going really fast through that, but you've already seen my other videos and you get a chance to practice right here on topics 2.3 through 2.5 on the study guide. So fill out that whole section. If you can do that, you totally get this. Okay, here in 2.6, we can finally put demand and supply together. You come up with equilibrium and you understand the idea of consumer surplus and producer surplus. Consumer surplus is the difference between what people are willing to pay, what they actually did pay, and producer surplus is the difference between the price and what sellers were actually willing to sell it for. When you put consumer and producer surplus together, that gives you the total surplus. And when this is maximized, a market is efficient. But what happens if we produce less quantity, we end up over here, well, we end up with dead weight loss, which is lost consumer and producer surplus and an inefficient market. Remember, you're gonna see dead weight loss a whole lot and you can have it on either side. So if we produce too little, we end up with dead weight loss here. If we produce too much, you can also have dead weight loss over here. But let's go back to consumer and producer surplus. There's a difference between being able to spot it and be able to calculate it. Make sure you can do the calculations and understand it's one half base times height to give you that triangle. So you're gonna have to practice, so take out the study guide, fill out topic 2.6, calculate that consumer and that produces surplus. Now topic 2.7 is probably the most important one because now you have to take supply and demand, start shifting them and identify what's gonna happen to price and quantity in the market. It starts off by talking about disequilibrium. So remember when the price is below equilibrium, we have a shortage because the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. When the price is above equilibrium, we have a surplus because the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. Again, a way to help you remember that idea is when the price is below equilibrium, it's short, that's a shortage. And remember the price never shifts the curve. A change in the price doesn't shift the demand or the supply at all. It just moves along the curve, changing the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied, not the demand and the supply. And that's one of the things your teacher or professor are totally gonna test you on. They're gonna say, okay, if the price goes up for corn, what happens to the demand for corn? The answer is nothing. The demand does not change, only the quantity demanded. So if the price goes up for corn, the quantity demanded will go down and will move along the curve, but it does not shift the curve. Every year, some students are like, no, no, you said price does, price of substitutes, or the price of resources, yes. Price of substitutes affects the demand, price of resources affects the supply, but the price of that actual product does not shift demand or supply. So here's a little trick for you. Whatever's on the Y axis, that doesn't shift the curve. So if a change in price occurs, that doesn't actually shift either of these curves. If this was wage up here, wage wouldn't shift the curve. That'll probably make more sense as we get to future units, but just remember, price does not shift demand or supply. Don't forget, price doesn't shift the curve, yarr. 
Thanks. Thank you. Okay, now let's talk about shifting these curves. It looks complicated, but remember, there's only four things that can occur. Demand can go up, demand can go down, supply can go up, or supply can go down. And in each of those situations, there's gonna be a change in the price and the quantity, and that's the most important thing, the thing your teacher wants to make sure you understand how to do. If there's this change in the market, what's gonna happen to price and quantity? Now, I don't really have an acronym to help you. Okay, if supply increases, the price goes down, quantity goes up, don't do that. Instead, when in doubt, Draw it out. Draw the graph every single time. It'll give you the right answer. And when there's a double shift, you can do the same thing. When the demand goes up and the supply goes up at the same time, you're gonna find out that two different things are gonna happen. Price goes up, quantity goes up when the demand goes up. When the supply goes up, price goes down and the quantity goes up. When you combine those results, you get the result of a double shift. Quantity is gonna go up, the price is gonna be indeterminate. Remember, that's the double shift rule. When two curves shift at the same time, one of them, either price or quantity, is gonna be indeterminate. How do you know which one? Draw it out. Now, I covered that pretty quick, and to make sure you got it, fill out the study guide, topic 2.7. Make sure you can show shortage surplus and show the four different shifts occur and double shifts. If you can do this, you totally understand the basics of supply and demand. Okay, now we're jumping into 2.8, which is gonna take all the concepts you learn, shortage, surplus, consumer surplus, producer surplus, shifting these curves, and put them all together and talk about government intervention. It starts off pretty easy with price ceilings and floors. Remember, it's the opposite of what you normally think. A price ceiling, if it's binding, must go below equilibrium and a price floor has to go above equilibrium to be binding, to have an effect in the market. If a ceiling is above equilibrium or a floor is below, it has no effect, price and quantity will stay exactly the same. Did you get that? Because I promise you that your teacher or professor is gonna make sure that's on the test. They're gonna put a price ceiling above equilibrium and say, okay, what's gonna happen? And you go, oh, there's gonna be a surplus. Nope. A price ceiling above equilibrium is not binding and has no effect on the market. So here's the rule. When you're taking your test and you see the word price ceiling or floor, ask yourself first before you do anything else, is it binding? Is it in the right spot? Price ceiling is a maximum of the price. It can't go up to equilibrium. We end up with consumer surplus, produce surplus, and deadweight loss. A price floor is a minimum of the price. It doesn't let the price go down. And again, we end up with consumer surplus, produce surplus, and deadweight loss. And remember, your teacher's not just gonna ask you to identify those areas. You have to actually calculate those areas as well. Now, for most students, the hardest part in this entire unit is when you go to the next level up and you start looking at taxes. The taxes shift supply to the left. The vertical distance between the supply curves is the amount of the tax per unit. And you end up with a consumer surplus, producer surplus, total revenue that goes to the government, and deadweight loss. I've made two different videos that talk about this concept and help you practice. And there's a reason for that. This is tough. You're going to have to sit down, do those calculations, find those areas, and find those boxes. And the problem here is there's so many different questions your teacher could ask that can say, okay, where's consumer surplus before the tax or consumer surplus after the tax? How much of that tax revenue is paid by the consumers? Where's the tax revenue in general? Dead weight loss, there's so many questions, so you've gotta see them all and you gotta practice them. And the best way to practice is to fill out the study guide. Topic 2.8, you've got the tax right here. I gave you both the areas and the numbers, so make sure you can spot the area, and if you can, also do the calculation to actually calculate consumer and produce surplus and get the numbers as well. When there's a tax, there's a box of tax revenue that goes to the government, or a tax wedge, and sometimes that's paid by consumers, sometimes it's paid by producers, and sometimes it's shared by both. For example, if the demand and the supply have the same elasticity, the tax burden will be on buyers and sellers equally. The way you can spot that is looking at the box and seeing how much dug into consumer surplus and how much dug into producer surplus. Watch what happens when the demand curve becomes more inelastic than the supply curve. The consumers pay more of the tax. They have bigger tax burden than those producers. And if the supply becomes more inelastic than the demand, then the burden of the tax goes on producers. The best way to show it to you is like this. Notice the supply curve is shifting the same exact way for every single one of these. The only thing that's different is the demand curve and its elasticity. When the demand is perfectly inelastic or vertical, then consumers pay all of that tax. Now, the demand is highly inelastic relative to the supply, then consumers pay most of the tax, but producers pay some too. When they have same elasticity, they share the tax equally. When the demand is more elastic than the supply, then producers pay more of that tax. And last one right here, you can see producers pay all that tax. And again, the best way to remember this is not to try to come up with some acronym, it's to draw the graph. When in doubt, Draw it out. Drawing that demand and supply curve, showing that tax box tells you, oh, okay, who pays the tax? For the majority of classes, topics 2.7 and 2.8 are the most important and most difficult topics to cover in this unit. Make sure you can do those shifts, show those areas, and do those calculations. Okay, the last thing we gotta cover is topic 2.9, 
international trade. Again, we're looking at consumer and producer surplus, but now instead of a ceiling or a floor, we're importing goods from another country. Like all the other concepts, I made a topic video that talks about it in detail. So if you need more help, go watch that. But here's the breakdown. If we can buy a product at a lower price than if we produce it ourselves, and the domestic amount we produce is here, and the amount we're gonna import is the difference between that quantity supplied we're gonna make ourselves and the quantity demanded that people actually want. So people are gonna consume this amount. That means consumer surplus will be here, producer surplus will be here, and there's no dead weight loss. Notice this is different than anything you've seen before because there's not a shortage right here. Instead, we're importing goods from another country. But if there's a quota or a tariff, then that world price goes a little bit up, so the consumer surplus gets smaller and the producer surplus gets bigger. This is not really a hard topic, it's just a reapplication of concepts you learned earlier in the unit. But like always, make sure you can actually calculate the area of consumer surplus and produce surplus and identify how it changed when there's a change in the world price and if there's a tariff, be able to spot and calculate the tariff revenue box. So to make sure you can do that, take out your study guide, answer those 10 questions for topic 2.9 international trade. Okay, that was an overview of the entire unit. You've got the whole study guide filled out. Of course, there's answer keys in the ultimate review packet. So go in there, see how you actually did. If for some reason you're like, okay, I don't understand that right answer, go back and watch the topic video on that topic to verify you're getting it. Overall, this is not a super hard unit. In fact, I would give it a three out of five in terms of difficulty, but in terms of importance, it's five out of five. You've got to know supply and demand and be able to shift these curves. And you're also going to see many of these concepts like consumer and produce surplus and dead weight loss in units four and unit six. As always, thanks so much for watching my videos and getting the ultimate review packet. Make sure to subscribe and like this video and let me know if you need anything else to help you learn and love economics. Thanks for watching, until next time.